Mr. Jair, um, can you make Sahil the panelist? Prabhu or whoever is handling yes, the yes, because they are presenting the first case. Sir, to whom, sir? Sahil. Sahil or Dr. Kavita. Okay. Dr. Juhi, too. Um, okay, since we have the rainbow group, uh, maybe we'll start with the rainbow cases and we'll wait for the others to join in. Dr. Rashmi, are you there? Yes, Dr. Nihal, I'm here. Okay, we'll start with your case then. Shall we start with my case? Okay. Yeah. So this is an eight-month-old baby uh, who was born in our hospital at 36 plus five weeks, uh, second uh, baby. Uh, the baby had, it was resuscitated at birth um, and the mother had diabetes mellitus in uh, pregnancy uh, and the baby had IUGI from the 28-week scan. Then after resuscitation, baby developed severe uh, PPHN and had to be given nitric oxide and multiple inotropes, adrenaline, dobutamine, and noradrenaline. So the hypothermia, therapeutic hypothermia could not be done for this baby because of severe metabolic acidosis. It was contraindicated and had to be stopped. The baby also had non-immune high drops, uh, but CMV was negative. And the baby had resistant hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia, which were, for which baby was given diazoxide and hydrocortisone. Day eight, cranial ultrasound showed a little bit of periventricular echogenicity, but otherwise the baby was okay. So the baby presented at the age of six months with uh, uh, typical infantile spasms. Uh, EEG at that time showed a uh, uh, high amplitude spike and wave, not typical hip arrhythmia, but could be consistent with infantile spasms. So we treated with high dose steroids and after 15 days repeated the EEG, which was completely normal. So uh, we thought, okay, that is the end. But then in the May uh, this year, baby had a recurrence uh, of some sort of an episode, most likely a focal infantile spasm. So when we did the EEG this time, there was typical uh, hip arrhythmia. So now I have started the baby on steroid and vigabatrin and four days into starting the steroids, it has completely stopped. So baby has no further seizures. Now the baby also has a mild developmental delay. So at eight months, she's not able to sit independently. She's not grasping onto things. And she's also got a slight uh, a tightness of her right arm. Uh, but other than that, uh, and her vision is also not uh, completely good. She doesn't focus properly and all that. Uh, Investigation-wise, her ammonia lactate was normal. SDOT was also normal. Uh, and uh, so this MRI was done at the age of eight uh, months after the first infantile spasm. And my question for the neuroradiologist is whether this MRI could be consistent with a perinatal brain injury or whether there could be an underlying uh, genetic disorder in view of her uh, you know, recurrence of infantile spasms. Anything in particular, Dr. Rashmi, for uh, the infantile um, spasms? No, uh, the, the, the radiologist uh, had reported... Uh, the no, no, I mean clinically. Um... Clinically, yeah. Uh, clinically, um, see, uh, clinically, there was this non-immune hydrox uh, okay. for which uh, only CMV was done. It was negative. Okay. And uh, of course, there was a lot of perinatal resuscitation and all that. Uh, but I was also worried that, you know, there were two episodes of infantile spasms, which was very unusual. And yep. uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so that's why I wanted to okay. uh, rule out if there's anything else. Okay. Okay, so I have the... Um... The flare sequence is on top, and you can appreciate that there is uh, some degree of gliosis over there in the superficial frontal uh, white matter. The 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 dactyl ventricles are prominent and dilated, demonstrating these wavy outlines along the dactyl aspects, more along the posterior margins. It is fairly slightly asymmetrical, but both the lateral ventricles are prominent, posterior to anterior gradient. The frontal horns, as you can see, are not as prominent as the occipital or the trigones or the posterior trigones. On the coronal images, again, these wavy outlines, the, there's reduction in the periventricular white matter reaching up to the cortex. I don't have a susceptibility weighted image, but this is uh, there was a focus of T2 hypointensity along the ep ependymal margin on the right side, possibly a suggestion of an hemocidrin deposit over there. The corpus callosum is diffusely thinned out. 
um, the brainstem is also slightly hypoplastic. There is inferior vermis, uh, some degree of infamous vermis hypoplasia. Pons are again hypoplastic. I think uh, that those were the only images I had of its positive findings. So I don't have a GRE. The diffusion did not demonstrate any abnormalities. Uh, but given that the history of uh, perinatal asphyxia at uh, preterm child, is thinking of possibility of PVL pattern uh, with a parasitical component, the only other differentials I thought of radiologically was the collagen vascular disorders, but they are usually present with slightly asymmetrical uh, pattern of uh, presentation, especially involving or uh, demonstrating porencephaly, chalencephaly, hemostatin deposit can be seen, and these white matter changes can also be demonstrated. Um, in the periventricular white matter changes can also be seen in collagen vascular disorders, but they typically have these ocular abnormalities and other systemic findings. Uh, Dr. Ashmi, just a question, is it a static related encephalopathy or is it a progressive disorder? Um, and any uh, patient see, there is there is there is some regression of milestones uh, that which might be because of the infantile spasms. The way we yeah. caught it up after the first uh, course of steroids, um, that is uh, one thing. The second is the the radiologist who reported the scan also said something about delayed myelination. Uh, no, this, there's no delayed myelination. These are uh, periventricles, oh. I mean, glasses or scarring. Okay. And this was talking an about the spectro showing some choline creatinine ratio, which was uh, slightly different, uh, something he had reported. It yeah, spectro actually wasn't required for this patient. Um, in an infantile patient, the choline peak is really high, mm -hmm. uh, but it does not does not demonstrate any uh, diagnostic uh, possibilities. Uh, I wouldn't, we wouldn't do a spectroscopy just looking at these scans anyway. Okay, okay. okay. So yeah, so yeah, I'll open the case for the panelists. Uh, uh, Comment upon. Any other comments in the chat? Yeah, from our perspective, I think uh, we would agree that this is an acquired injury. And uh, I think the IUGR at 28 weeks and the history was relevant. Uh, that probably led to some germinal matrix hemorrhage as well. So a lot has been going on since that time and said by the looks of it. The prematurity of the brain uh, would be related to that particular time frame. Uh, I don't think that there's anything else to go with here. Uh, the only question I had was, and I still had that question particularly, thought, why was metabolic acidosis a contraindication to ongoing therapeutic cooling? I don't know if my neurologist is here. <laughs> um, he said that a severe metabolic acidosis uh, is a contraindication for cooling. That's what he told me. And the baby had very severe metabolic acidosis. That's, that's the answer. But you, were halfway, but you were halfway through cooling anyways, right? How 18 hours was done. Hmm? Sorry? You would have cooled for how long in total? Uh, only five, five hours the baby was cooled. 13 hours they uh, started cooling. And at 18 okay. hours they, it was stopped. But I think uh, probably uh, the events in the brain would have gone back to at least before 34 weeks. That's mm -hmm. the time when the matrix matures. And I think though you don't have gradient echo and all that, Nihal, you'll agree that there is hem hemosiderin on the right side. Yeah, there is. So the, these could have now, gone so even uh, in the fetal period, correct? All this. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, so uh, I don't think there's any difference. difference. At any time under the 37 weeks of gestation. The other thing, um, I, you couldn't scroll these images anyhow, but they've lost their mammillary body, right? It's a feature of hypoxic ischemic injury as well, which would be supportive. From those pictures, I can't see anything that would be called as a healthy mammillary body. No, uh, I can't see them. Yeah. Yeah, which would also be supportive of hypoxia at that time and would actually relate to not just a motor disorder, but also memory problems going forward. Um, yeah, the other thing expecting would be uh, thalamic uh, scarring as well, but none of these pictures shows a thalamite. Mm -hmm. But um, we would expect to see a little bit of thalamic yeah. scarring too. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a comment from Dasha that uh, severe PPHN is a contraindication for therapeutic hypothermia. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the baby had extremely severe PPHN, nitric oxide and three inotropes to control the PPHN. So. Um, okay, so it's more uh, prematurity related brain injury, which might have happened around the age of 28 weeks, uh, the effects of which we are seeing now, and there doesn't seem to be an underlying genetic dis disorder to conclude. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, all right, thanks. Sahil, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. 
yes sir so this is a, a 22 month old male child so this child had a significant perinatal history so for seven days in view of respiratory distress and neonatal hypoglycemia also had neonatal seizures for which uh, for which the child was started on uh, phenobarbitone and uh, levera and after which there was no and there is global developmental delay since birth so currently this child is 22 uh, months old and on examination there is microcephaly drooling spasticity more of uh, spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy and this mri was done on uh, day of life five yes sir okay and uh, blood work was done before or after the mri Hello. What is GDM? Sorry, guys. Gestational, gestational diabetes. diabetes. Right, okay, yeah. Uh, gestational diabetes mellitus. Okay. Yes, sir. So and this scan was done on day of life five. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, was the blood work done before the yes, scan sir. or after the scan? After the scan, sir. After the, the few investigations have done before, and the okay. CSF was done after the scan. Yes. Okay. Sir. Okay. We'll get back to the investigations after the scan. All right. So on top, I have the T2 axles and T1 uh, on bottom are the T1 on contrast uh, axle sequences. And you can appreciate that there are a bilateral uh, hemorrhagic foci in the periventral and deep white matter right more than the left. Along the medullary veins, there is possibly an underlying medullary vein thrombosis or congestion really leading to these hemorrhagic infarction or venous hemorrhagic infarction like changes. There's also intraventricular hemorrhage um, along the lateral ventricles over here in the occipital horns. Some foci of the parenchymal hemorrhage in the superficial uh, pre-children regions. Uh, posterior predominant uh, cerebellar uh, subdural hemorrhage is possibly related to the uh, birthing process. Um, then we have the on top of the diffusion wave sequences. Again, you can appreciate this hemorrhagic venous type impacted pattern demonstrated in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres. Um, periventricular deep white matter extending up to the superficial white matter. And on the SWI or the GRE sequences, you can appreciate that there is blooming of the Hemorrhagic foci, which was demonstrated on the T1 sequences. And then, uh, the, at least radiologically, I would think of diagnosis of uh, medullary vein thrombosis leading to these uh, changes in the brain parenchyma, hemorrhagic venous infarctions. And this is a paper from Dr. Manka that all, um, and we're lucky to have him on the panel. And these are the possible neonatal causes of uh, the hemorrhage related abnormalities in the neonatal period. Uh, the question now, Sahil, is uh, were there any coagulopathy related disorders, any cardiac uh, abnormalities? and other workup for infection of sepsis um, for the child. So the sepsis profile, the CRP was 15. Rest of all, the uh, as the CSF was hemorrhagic tap, so uh, we could not uh, probably establish count, corrected TLC count in this child. CRP was 15 and rest of all investigations were normal and uh, uh, sodium put everything was normal, sir. Uh, we uh, They have not done a 2D echo this is the set of investigations that were done when the child was of uh, day of life five, sir. Okay. So they have not done uh, 2D echo and the coagulation profile was also not done in this child. So, yes, sir. Okay. Over to the panelists. So actually it was a lab uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, actually, it was labeled as a intraventricular hemorrhage because of uh, prematurity. And the child uh, there is the was actually three kg. Uh, yeah. But the predominant change are in the parent time up. And you can see the medullary veins, um, they're showing congestion or they're a typical pattern for a deep medullary vein thrombosis. Okay, where are the medullary veins seen? Uh, the hemorrhage is covering them. But underlying, oh. if you see these linear areas over there, uh, these are the regions where the medullary veins are there. Oh. <clears throat> because, I think uh, ask the can. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No issues. Yeah, tell me. No, no, please. Uh. Yeah, no. So we had this doubt that why he should have so much of uh, uh, interventricular hemorrhage and it is, you know, seeping out so much into the parenchyma. So this was looking very odd to us. And especially mm. he had a weight of 3 kg, of course, that is because of GDM as well. So mm. it was not like a very 
uh, extreme preterm baby with a lot of no, it, it, no the hemorrhage yeah. pattern is not of the GA, the germinal matrix hemorrhage. I think that's what was reported, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, you were saying something. Yeah, so these are the medullary veins, Dr. Kavita, on the ATW2 sequences, these linear areas um, on these images, which are similarly seen in your patient. Um, so these uh, actually on the GRE, they bloom, so they are suggestive of uh, some form of congestion or thrombosis, which leads to this venous hemorrhagic infarcted type pattern. So the primary pattern is in the parenchyma, whereas the interventricular hemorrhage is there, but it is not the primary uh, suspect, at least in this case. And coagulopathy yes. is the most common related disorders, I mean, related etiology is causing these um, changes. Okay, sure. So, Thanks. so uh, diabetes and all those uh, like conditions cannot really explain everything, right? There was no polycythemia. I think we saw the hemoglobin just now. So there was not much of a... No, no, there was no polycythemia. Yeah, have they mentioned the hemoglobin? Let's check. I think there was no polycythemia. Uh, oh, here 16.4 is, is fine for a newborn. Yeah, 16.4 for a newborn is fine. Okay. So, I'll we have the anything? further investigation, no? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. This is the set yeah. of investigation done. Do we have any further investigations? Have we done the coagulation? The child was of five, six, respectively. Hello, am I audible? Sahil, um, uh, coagulation profile. Was, was it, it done? done? It, it was not done, sir. It was not done. I actually, I'm getting a lot of static. It was not done. Okay. So I think we'll plan a coagulation profile now. So this child now has actually very uh, uh, severe spasticity involving all the four limbs, but uh, more of on the left side or right side. I don't know. I forgot which side. One side is much more involved as compared. I think the left side, maybe. Left side, ma'am. Left side. Yeah. Left side, yeah. So there is severe spasticity. It's not like a typical pattern of a PVL in a premature where you have lower limb more than the mm. upper limb. So it's a left side which is uh, very severely affected with a lot of dystonia as well as compared to the right side. So everything was going very odd for a preterm. So I think we'll need to rule out a coagulopathy. Any other comments from the other experts? Generally, this kind of uh, deep medullary thrombosis are usually associated with systemic sepsis. And uh, sometimes we have found protein C protein S deficiencies, uh, not very commonly. Most common etiology would be a systemic sepsis. Yeah, we'll uh, actually rule out now. Blood, cul blood culture, uh, CS culture was negative, and CRP was also 15 with normal TLC count, sir. Uh, so. There's a dog barking in the background. <laughs> it's my dog. I'm sorry. I'm not able to. Amazing. Yeah. Show us, show us the dog. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about this one. Um, Vajiha's comment about JAM3. Um, it's quite an early presentation for a JAM3 related disorder, right? I mean, Yale is at the meeting too, for instance. But why JAM3 particularly? No, no one is speaking. I think Ian, I can't hear anything. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Vajiha has uh, asked whether uh, about Jam3. We'll read about it and find out. Thank you very much. Okay, we can. Yeah, more to next. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jui, go there. 
Yes. Hello, everyone. So uh, this was a nine-month-old uh, male child who was first born of a consanguineous marriage and presented with global developmental delay, and there was no history of any adverse perinatal event. On examination, the head size was normal. There were mild dystonias, and there was some hypopigmentation of the hair, and then the MRI. Only of the hair, Dr. G, not, not of the skin, right? Uh, not of the skin, I would say. And this, okay. what I'm saying is more in terms of, I got a look like B12 deficiency children. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So at nine months, um, I have the T2 ADS sequences and you can, you can appreciate that the myelination is delayed for a child of a nine month old. Um, there's diffuse T2 hyperintensity in the cerebral hemisphere pedom, especially in the posterior and mid cerebral hemisphere, which are supposed to be myelinated at this age. Um, so diffuse uh, T2 hyperhomogeneous hyperintensities. There are some linear striated appearance in the subparticle region, the temporal lobes. Um, they look, at least to me, like the virtual Robin spaces or perivascular spaces because of the striated pattern. Uh, nothing in the posterior fossa. Um, the corpus callosum is diffusely thinned out. No structural abnormalities associated with it. Uh, the deep brain nuclei, at least to me, did not demonstrate any uh, significant abnormalities. On the T1 video sequences, uh, again, the typical uh, hypomyelinating type of pattern uh, appreciated for there, but the main changes are on the T2 video sequences. And these are the zoomed in images of the uh, subcortical uh, areas in the anterior temporal folds. And you can appreciate that these are actually, at least to me, look like prominent subcorticals, uh, perivascular spaces rather than subcortical cysts. Um, and based on that MRI pattern, think of possibility of uh, delayed myelination going into the hypomyelinating pattern. Uh, but an MRI would be required after the age of one year or a gap of six months uh, to term it as hypomyelination. Uh, I thought possibly the, uh, the hyperpigmentation could be um, a clinical clue, but uh, as between B12, as Dr. Jui had said, I don't think any of these fit. The only thing was the corpus callosum thinning and the hypomyelination with the hyperpigmentation is commonly seen in Salas disease. Um, so that was one of the differentials we thought of. And these are the other clinical differentials for hyperpigmentation of the skin. And we can see that, again, Cialic aciduria has hyperpigmented skin, but not hair. And these are other uh, disorders with um, hyperpigmentation of the skin and hair. So these were uh, the thoughts which I thought uh, on the differentials which we thought of, and I'll open the case for the panelists. So I have a few questions in this case. Uh, as per, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as by my understanding, to differentiate between hypomyelination and dysmyelination, both may have T2 hyper intensities, but uh, hypo will not be as bright as this myelination, and T1 will be iso intense for hypomyelination, will be which may be hypo intense for uh, dysmyelination. But in this child, there are certain T1 hypo areas. Uh, I don't know if we have the images here, but uh, so, for example, let's say the uh, top row fourth image, we can see some of those T1 hypo areas, which are, let's say, in the left anterior temporal pole and even other areas. In certain cuts, they were looking more prominent. So, how do yeah. we explain those T1 hypo areas? Is there a component of dysmyelination as well? Do you want to take that up or? Okay, so this age is nine months, right? Yeah. Okay. The definite findings here are the thin corpus callosum, very thin corpus callosum, hello, have a place here with. And the other finding is uh, this patchy signal change that you have shown. And I don't think we have a handle at the moment to clarify whether this is all delayed myelination given the T1 and T2 weighted appearances or whether this is going to be a hypo or a dysmyelinating disorder. The important thing is that it's affecting the cerebral hemispheres more than the hindbrain and the brain stem, as you can see there. So uh, I don't think we can label it right now. You're right, we might need a repeat scan. But what seems to be emerging is these temporal subcortical changes that might emerge as a stronger feature when you repeat the image. Is there microcephaly? Is that what the initial slide said? I'm very confused between cases now. Uh, not really. There is no. Not the not no. The so if the head size is normal and they're not losing uh, their head circumference, which doesn't seem to happen on the scan at least, then we might be able to sit on this and repeat the scan. 
if you start getting severe microcephaly happening, then you know you've got certain things that you can test for right away. But right now, I don't think you can label it as anything specific in terms of hypo and this and all that, because everything is quite delayed in this particular case. So you should still check for your thyroid functions and all those things, just to make sure you've checked out uh, B12, other vitamin deficiencies, which can cause delayed myelination. Clinically speaking, are they losing skills or retrogressing, or is it what is the decline? So there is a significant delay. There is no neck holding, no fixation. So um, there are hardly any milestones gained, although there is no regression. Yeah. So even if you do two sequences in uh, six months' time, and I think that's what should be done to look at which direction this is going, you can at least then decide if this is actually hypomyelinating or not. At the moment, I wouldn't label this as hypomyelinating. And there are again two patterns there. There's a patchy and then there is a diffuse hypomyelinating disorder. The sparing of the cerebellum, relative sparing of the cerebellum and brain stem is interesting here. I believe uh, the cerebrum might lose volume in time. And Nihal, you are showing those uh, changes in the anterior temporal regions bilaterally. There is a small differential for that, but the head size might be interesting to know in that respect, with the normal head size, which of the ones you would actually go for. And of all these possibilities, um, at the moment, none of them is fitting if you think about it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, as we say that below one year of age, uh, we should call it delayed myelination. And to label hypomyelination, we should have an MRI after six months. But then yeah. in certain cases, we do take a call. If there is marked hypomyelination, we do take a call to send the genetics right away. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so in this case, uh, should the genetics not, be sent or we should wait? Uh, I wouldn't send a hypomyelination panel. If you want to do some basic genetics from a radiological perspective, that I mean, this would probably end up being genetic anyways. But I don't think this is going to be a primary hypomyelinating disorder, at least based on the current scan. Okay. Okay. So, so it's not clearly a hypomyelinating leukodystrophy. It's not that. That's correct. Good. Okay. 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 Thank you. This was helpful. Okay, thank you. Apura, over to you. I hope you're able to join us. Oh, uh, yeah. This is a six year, seven month old boy who had come with history of headache, more, of, uh, more prominent over the back of the neck and the occipital region, and occasionally on the frontal regions in seven days. Uh, after, uh, after about four, two days, the child had uh, episodes of projectile vomiting and had poor oral intake. By the time he presented to us after seven days, he was not able to walk. He had a taxic kid and uh, he had encephalopathy since one day prior to presentation to us. There is also a history of sleep disturbances due to pain. So they also got the MRI done and they had come with the MRI. Oh, the CT also done? I have a CT. Uh, yes, yes, sir. They got a CT done, sir. Okay. So I have the initial, okay. So I have an initial CT um, one week into the presentation, a non contrast CT. Um, and you can appreciate that the abnormality is in the posterior fossa, especially the left cerebellum, uh, demonstrates its hyperensity, which is causing some degree of mass effect on the fourth ventricle, resulting in a form of a mild degree hydrocephalus or ventricularly on top. Um, Possibly cerebral edema, but um, I'm not sure of the slice thickness of the CT scan. Uh, but anyway, we got an MRI to further evaluate this child. I think that was an external MRI too. And on the MRI, you can appreciate that there is um, this left cerebellar abnormality crossing the midline, resulting uh, in the mass effect on the fourth ventricle, extending up to the vermis. Um, the predominant left sided uh, T2 and flare hyperintensity. Post contrast, um, uh, there is uh, some degree of leptomeningeal enhancement over there. Um, and you can appreciate that again, the mass effect causing on the fourth ventricle, resulting in the supratentorial uh, ventricle megaly or hydrocephalus. Um, the coronal sequences and tetal sequences again demonstrate the uh, patchy or linear enhancement pattern. I can tell that the, uh, the diffusion was, uh, there was a mixed pattern of diffusion. I don't have the sequences, but uh, there was uh, areas of cystical diffusion and vasogenic edema, especially diffusion. Uh, so these were the main imaging findings. 
and then the differentials on these imaging patterns are uh, thinking of cerebellitis, and then possibilities of uh, so, I mean, this disease, but the, the striated pattern was absent in our case. So it's predominantly particle related, and the gray white matter differentiation is really seen. It is not uh, as evident or as blurred out in our case. So uh, slightly uh, atyp unusual for Loma Duplos, so more in the favor of cerebellitis. And this was a paper from the Hopkins group, which tried to differentiate uh, the pseudotumoral hemicerebellitis from the Loma Duplos. And again, what they found was the striated pattern was typical in Loma Duplos syndrome, uh, where other abnormalities were pretty much the same or common in both the diseases. Of course, spectroscopy helped, but we do not have any spectroscopy in our case. And the, we don't have a gradient sequence too. And gradient sequence, again, demonstrates a prominent signal wide in the Loma Duplos whereas compared to the hemicerebellitis. Uh, we, I think we have a diagnosis, but I'll open the case for the, um, for the comments if there, anyone has any further suggestions or uh, approach to these disorders. It is usually facilitated, uh, I think Dr. Amir is asking a question or diffusion on Lemma Duplos. You have only one time point, right, for this? Yeah, seven days. Okay. Somebody said embryonal. I'm not thinking embryonal tumor at this point in time. Uh, there was something in the tracheostomy too. Uh, any infection was adenovirus is this the right one? Apurva? The secretions had adenovirus. No, no, sir. Okay, no not this one. Okay, okay, okay. Can you show it again the supratentoria and we just seeing the cerebellum? Uh, I only had the CT uh, AL, uh, the MRI demonstrates similar picture, nothing in the supratentorium. I think Yale's point is correct. If this turns out to be an inflammatory process, by and large, you would pick up some subtle changes in the cortex supratentorially yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, because we were always quite uh, curious if uh, isolated cerebellitis will have like more antibodies and things. And actually, um, uh, we have not seen it. Uh, Kish and I, I think, have tested quite a lot of patients. But uh, if you do have a supratentorial or spinal cord uh, involvement or eyes, then this could, could well be like a MOG uh, thing. I'm um, slightly, yeah. I don't know, I think I understand the sequence because actually on this picture, it nearly looked like a bit more like a tumor. So, you know, I'm struggling a bit, but on the T2, it looks quite inflammatory in nature. I don't know, Kish, what, what do you think? Sorry, Yale, I didn't get that. I'm on just the saying on this yeah. image, it looks like it could well be inflammatory, but on the other sequence, it looks like a tumor. So I don't know. Uh, I would have asked yeah, you. Think, yeah, it is, it is quite angry and inflammatory, quite asymmetric. Uh, we were thinking down, and it's quite an acute presentation, so we will have to go with that anyways, but which inflammatory and how far we'll go, uh, you know. I mean, I think with the, with the with inflammatory, I mean, as I said, I think it could be if there is other, you know, a supratentorial involvement or anything, then, you know, the, the, the likelihood of this being labeled as an ADEM with a 50% chance of having more antibody is, is one thing. But actively yeah. malinate. I mean, it's not. It doesn't really matter because you treat them all the same. Uh, I mean, I think the question is, do we think this could be something, uh, you know, non-inflammatory? Because if it's inflammatory, it's a bit semantic to label. You would treat this as a, um, yeah. you, you know, you tumor factive demyelination from whatever sets. If it's just a cerebellum, normally we don't give it. You know, we don't find anything. It's just cerebellum tend to be monophasic, and uh, you treat the pressure a bit, and uh, that's it. Is what it is. And the other thing would be yeah. an infective process in itself without actually having the uh, immune inflammatory component, it could still be a primary infection. Like, like what? I mean, TB, but beyond TB? No, TB, of course, is always there, but uh, even the viruses and uh, the bacterial infections, given the enhancement pattern uh, and the acuteness of the hydrocephalus with which it presents with so much rage, I think we can't exclude that. Eventually, of course, we go down that list and start thinking, you know, HLH and all that. But I think this is quite an acute presentation right now. So and, it looks and like also, Kish, the enhancement is not typical to what we see with HLH, no? Um, or would you still it's think? It's yeah. an evolving space, I think, that one. But okay. uh, it looks like the answer here was from the biopsy, so I don't think this was HLH anyways. Okay. There are no labs here, no. 
I think Nihal has the answer for this one. Uh, Apurvash, do you want to go ahead? Uh, actually, biopsy was done, sir. But okay. uh, biopsy was not suggestive of any tumor. Okay. And and you've done the MOG presume or not? Uh, MOG was not sent. Uh, and what did the C did you get some CSF when you've done the biopsy? Uh, no, we had not sent the CSF as well. Okay, and do you know if on the biopsy they've they've done any other kind of infective screen or anything? Uh yes, I'd say it had been sent, but that is awaited. Okay, so we do we have an answer? Or we don't have an answer. We do not have an answer to this. Okay, okay. And and is it possible? Is the child stable enough to get some CSF? Uh yeah, child is stable now. He's walking. Okay. Uh did you get any treatments? Uh yeah. Uh this uh Extraction of the tumor, not exactly, was done. Um, will, uh, with this biopsy, even, you know, we've had a couple of HHV6s out there, and, you know, we always wonder whether that was real or not, for instance. <laughs> I, I mean, in a way, way the, the biopsy is really not informative beyond telling us yeah. this is not a tumor. They label it as the... Uh, Possible hemicerebellitis, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so so I mean I, I don't know because I, I also understand there's some technicality things. So you know, I I know that actually maybe repeating the scan uh with getting you know a full brain sequence may may be informative to see where the lesions are going. I presume there's been we know that many of these lesions are very dynamic. You know, I personally uh, would like to to do a lumbar function, including looking at the pressure to check that you're not running a child with a very high pressure. So you can go blind secondary to that. There's been even some cases of hemicerebellitis that, uh, you know, have coned. Uh, uh, and, and, and beyond that, I think, uh, you know, if, you, if you're happy there's no infection and the child is still symptomatic, you can use some steroids. Uh, uh, child is discharged on uh, steroids. Exactly. I don't think this kid will cone, Vivek, uh, in response to your... I think the kid needs an LP to take it forward anyways. But uh, what does neovascularization on the biopsy report actually mean? You might want to ask the histologist that because that is quite unusual for an inflammatory process of sort of huge nature. Uh, um, that biopsy report needs to be broken down a little bit. Yeah. What does that mean, diffuse neovascularization? And it says chronic inflammation as well, but the history is not chronic. That means something has been happening in this brain for a while, isn't it? Yeah, so another timing of the MRI and some CSF is, is probably required to kind of, uh, uh, I think the likelihood of this actually being, you know, an inflammatory thing, you know, the outcome generally is not that bad if, if they don't uh, get complicated with the pressure at the acute um, event. And if the child is now walking, that's a pretty good sign. And the histiocytic infiltrate, what about that? I'm just trying to break this down to figure out where all the like kids don't they always, even with our biopsy, they always mention this histiocytic and it's never HLH. No, no, not going the HLH way. I'm thinking about the other histiocytic problems, crystal disease and all that. But the, the thickened leptomeninges, if it's an accurate representation of the uh, histology and chronic inflammation, is telling us that there is something that has been going on for a while, anyways, which may not mean, which may means that this is not all that acute as we think it is. Uh, any hemorrhage on any of the sequences? Because all we have is T1, T2 contrast. No, no hemorrhage. Though this is an external scan, but there was no hemorrhage. A follow up scan was done. They had partially, partially resected the left cerebellar um, lesion, but no supraventral findings again. Oh, wow. So they resected this thing. I think the, the biopsy, with part of the biopsy, part of the, part of the left anyone, cerebellum was resected. Is anyone doing metagenomics in India? Can you repeat the question? 
is, is any lab offering metagenomics in India? I think metagenome, if we uh, ask them to do some specific staining in, uh, I mean, in the tissue, they may be able to. I also think that if this child is uh, immunocompetent and is, you know, overall quite well, not then, you know, we need to also think what's common is is common. So, um, no, or are you just very struck by the by the picture? What is metagenomics? Metagenomic is a, is a method of uh, sequencing the brain tissue to see if there's any foreign DNA and RNA to suggest. So, so instead of testing for every virus or every bacteria, you can just do a screen and it, they can do it on CSF. The, the, the utility is not as good, but sometimes they do it on brain tissue and they can sometimes even recognize um, a new type of viruses, particularly in immunocompetence individuals that you don't really know what to, to, to screen for. Uh, so this is something that you know was proven, I think with us at least, very useful if you have uh, you know patients that are severely immunosuppressed and you don't really know what you're dealing with. Uh, but if this child has an, a competent immune system, I will be slightly less worried that this is kind of a totally new virus or bacteria. Okay. Vivek and Kavita, if half of the cerebellum has been removed now, why would you not do an LP? What is going? There's nothing to cone. This is. I think we need to start with like an LP before we. Uh... Yeah. No. After resection, there is no uh, not that much. Uh, but, yeah. so, and I would make sure you do the bands, the oligoclonal bands. It will give us a bit of a sense of chronicity. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Kish, I interrupted you. No, 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 we're saying the same things. Uh, and in fact, uh, since uh, Nihal said how the cerebellum has been taken out, there's no tissue left to go on. And I think the dog agreed with me in the background. No, no, half, half the abnormal uh, enhancing cerebellum, not the, uh, the, the left half, just the, left, the part of the left uh, enhancing focus. And uh, I'm just looking at the biopsy report and they had mentioned the differentials include a lymphohistocytic disorder, which can be part of the secondary tissue based on immunological response and uh, was highly suggestive of the first diagnosis with the was highly suggestive of pseudotumor cerebellitis. However, advised microbiological and serological workup to identify the triggering the infection. So I have a question for Jen. Uh, like uh, when we give steroids in situations like this where it's almost an emergency to decompress it, by giving steroids, then after how long do we expect that it may change the immunological profile, like oligoclonal bands or uh, the antibodies? It doesn't. It doesn't. Steroids don't change the immunological compound. We know it from all those children that we've, we've treated. Um, oligoclonal band, it's in the brain. So, you know, nothing really changed the oligoclonal band. Uh, with some of these serum antibodies, only if you do plasmic change and you plex it out, then you know you may get an F falsely negative. The steroids do not do not make an effect. If you start testing cytokines and things like this, sometimes it makes an effect. But actually, you know, most of the abnormalities that we see are so striking they're not really borderline. The so steroids don't tend to influence uh, immunodeficiency and things. People like to do it off steroids if you measure T cells or B cell function. But but for the for the markers that we use, you know, uh, we do not need to. Uh, hold off steroids before we do the test. And same applies for the antibodies as well? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, okay, I guess I shared something. Uh, thanks, Is that chat GPT? <laughs> I'll share the biopsy report on the uh, WhatsApp group. I'm not able to share it here, but yeah, in want of time, we'll move on to our next game. So we should know the follow-up of this uh, case. Yeah, got it. Uh, we'll include that in the, whenever we yeah. end. Follow Thanks. Pituja, if you're there. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is a child, uh, two years old female with developmental regression since 12 months of age. Initially, developmental milestones were achieved appropriately for the age. And at 12 months of age, she gradually had uh, regression of the achieved milestones. She was uh, not able to stand. She lost the ability to walk and gradually she was not able to sit even without support. 
she was speaking in sentences now the vocabulary reduced to around 50% of the previous time and she was not able uh, to eat uh, finger foods on her own which she was doing um, uh, before the um, uh, issues started and she had uh, a tinge of drooling uh, of the saliva was present uh, she had uh, she was born to non consanguineous parents uh, with no postnatal complications and initially developmental milestones as i mentioned were normal so uh, she was uh, being treated at outside hospital where ncs studying was done and that showed demyelinating motor and sensory neuropathy and blood investigations as well as genetic testing had been done uh, after okay. around 8 months uh, mri scan was done for this child so genetics was done before the first mri scan is that right prithika yes yes sir okay Uh, so I have uh, these images from the image from the films, uh, slightly pixelated. Um, and this is at what age, Pritija? Any idea? I think it was eight months back. One year, nine months of age. This first MRI. Okay. Um, so all right. So these are T2 axles. Some um, so the images are slightly. I mean, not clear, but you cannot appreciate any significant other than the typical areas of the. What we term as terminal zones of myelination, or some areas of delayed myelination, over there. Uh, no structural abnormalities. Posterior fossa looks normal in terms of volume. Supratentorial also no significant volume loss. Possibly in the frontal regions over there, but nothing very, uh, nothing standing out. Please tell me. A diffusion um, again. The images are not optimal. The only thing I could. Appreciate was this focus in the median aspect of the spleen of the corpus callosum. Whether this was real or not, I don't have an ABC to correlate that. Um, yeah, so nothing. Um, again, nothing standing out on the diffusion wave sequences. Uh, this is a sagittal flare which we had, and this possible the thinning of the corpus callosum. Uh, but other than that, I cannot appreciate any signal uh, changes in the sagittal sequences. Brain stem, uh, the pons is slightly hypoplastic, but again, not very significant. And then, Pritija, this was a case. This was the follow-up was um, yes, eight months later. Uh, yes, the follow-up was eight months later after the genetic report. They even had done the uh, enzymes level as well. And with okay. the MRI not having any significant finding, after six months of presentation to us, we plan to repeat the MRI. Okay. So this is the MRI done last week. Um, So and now you can see that the changes have significantly progressed. There is a uh, pediment or diffuse pattern involvement of the bilateral cerebral spheres, a leukodystrophy type pattern with myelin sparing zones. Uh, the basal ganglia are slightly hyperintense. The thalamus are reduced in volume, demonstrating T2 hyperintensities predominantly in the superior and ventrolateral thalamus. Um, cerebellar white matter, the the cerebral peduncles are also slightly hyperintense for a two and a half year old child. And on the diffusion weighted sequences, you have these um, area restricted diffusion in the corpus callosum, the posterior and the anterior aspects, and also in the periventricular and deep white matter. And nothing standing out in the posterior fossa in terms of diffusion weighted sequences, but given the the imaging findings, um, the diagnosis, uh, what we thought was a lysosomal disorder uh, likely related to metachromatic leukodystrophy. Um, yeah, again, flare images uh, demonstrating these corresponding changes on the T2 weighted sequences. Um, additionally, again. There was a thickening of the optic nerves, but appreciate on the thin cut T1 sequence sequences. You know, can appreciate here on the T1 sag, the optic nerves were thickened. There is a reduction in the volume of the supratentorial brain, the brainstem, and the vermis is slightly hypoplastic. So, given these features, um, the likely diagnosis was for a blastomal disorder (MLD) uh, was the most likely possibility which we had proposed. And um, uh, Prithuja, if you have yes, an answer. Uh, the um, investigations that were done outside, we repeated the enzyme level and the MRI. The RL sulfatase level done outside was normal. That was six months back. But when we repeated this time, uh, the RL sulfatase level was low. So uh, it was significantly low with level of six point nine and range given to be sixty seven to three hundred and ninety six. And a nerve conduction study suggestive of demyelinating motor and sensory neuropathy. And uh, whole exome sequencing was done. That was suggestive of ARSA mutation with compound heterozygous. And uh, the current reports uh, suggestive uh, again demyelinating neuropathy in NCS and a low level of RL sulfatase levels. So now, if you go back to the initial scans here, I think uh, the clues were there actually. So I think. 
the white matter signal in the cerebral hemispheres is not normal on those scans. We cannot dismiss these as terminal zones of myelination. And uh, though there are only four pictures on the axial, where is the thalamus there? You can't see it. No, I, um, no, these are from films. I didn't have them. Yeah, yeah, no, even then, but you should see a little more thalamus by now. Right? No, they, it, there was comment. I mean, they termed it as delayed myelination, but yeah. Oh, I see. But it was, yeah, we would have called that license. I mean, they, 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 had a, they had a genetic diagnosis of ARSA before the MRI. Oh, wow. They got they got the MRI done and changes were not as um, prominent or significant as what they thought. Then they repeated an MRI last week and then the changes have blown out. We were thinking a bit aloud the uh, the splenial and the changes yeah, in the general yeah. on the follow up. Um, are they really restricting on the ADC as well? It's a bit unusual. Yeah. But I any liver dystrophy can give that, though we haven't really seen restricted diffusion in the corpus callosum. Uh, no, they are they are restricting. They are restricting. Uh, we, we had a phase, uh, I think six months back, we had uh, significant uh, areas of restriction. Yeah. Even the would white. That, yeah. Would that then actually be a marker for active tumor, active disease at that? Yeah, stage? active demyelination. Yeah. I think that's what's happening. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone right. know what happens to the vision in these patients? Because we keep calling this optic nerve thickened in both MLD and Kravis, but do they actually suffer from a visual problem as such, clinically speaking? Uh, this child was uh, tracking good. The vision was good, but she had a horizontal nystagmus was present. But the stagments is more, I don't think, related to the uh, That vision was good for him. Yeah, and they, uh, they do get the other cranial nerves, particularly the trigeminals also involved in most of these cases that you're showing here. But I don't know whether clinically they have manifestations of those cranial nerves. Generally, nothing much clinically uh, because the uh, gross or severe gross motor and the cognitive disabilities uh, take to forefront and also the peripheral neuropathies they do manifest more uh, so the cranial nerves generally don't manifest too much they can develop optic atrophy as a manifestation uh, that is in the very later stages somebody has said our sex this is uh, not the picture for our sex and Nihal can tell us why yeah, the brainstem usually has the found as a the um, typical tigroid pattern, which was not seen in our case. Um, there is also a reduction in the cerebellar atrophy and also spinal cord atrophy. Um, but these and the leukodystrophy type pattern is typically not seen in our sites. The brainstem findings are missing for our sites. And clinically, they have a progressive spasticity. Spastic is, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. We'll move on to the next case. Devanga, over to you. Uh, actually, this child we had not seen. We have done just a telephonic con uh, consultation had been done. Uh, this is a five years old male child uh, who was admitted with high grade fever spike, uh, who had high grade fever spike by end of uh, April. He was initially treated as enteric fever. Uh, he had fever for one week and then fever gradually subsided. And then by, uh, uh, sorry, by uh, the end of last month, March. And then by mid of April to end of April, he presented with generalized weakness, inability to walk and reduced oral intake. Uh, since the child had high grade fever, he was initially treated as enteric fever outside. And then uh, in middle, he had received some homeopathic medication. Fever spikes, however, subsided, but generalized weakness uh, persistently had increased such that the child was not able to walk. Uh, so by uh, so the child had presented to us and MRI was sent, actually. Okay. MRI had been done and MRI was sent to us for consultation. All right, uh, so I have the MRI. I think uh, 
within two is it two to three weeks within the illness period uh, dibanga or uh, yeah length? it's around uh, one week uh, one month of illness around three to four okay. weeks okay okay so one month of illness there is a reduction in the supratentorial and infratentorial volume a generalized reduction in the volume loss but the predominant changes as you can see on the t2 and the fair sequences are in the bilateral cerebellar hemisphere as also involving the part of the brain stem these multifocal uh, lesions with uh, various uh, variable t2 hyper intensities uh, the peripheral rim demonstrate t2 hypo intensities uh, also involving the bilateral thalami the internal capsules and the areas of the subcortical deep parietal lobes on both sides um so these were the main findings the posterior fossa structures uh, posterior fossa had these multiple uh, looking like a tumor factor demyelinating type pattern lesions uh, on the diffusion weighted sequences uh, the the posterior fossa lesions some of the peripheral aspects demonstrated to restricted diffusion as you can see on the adc sequences whereas the thalamic lesions and the parietal lobe uh, had possibly a t2 shine through over there which do not correspondingly demonstrate low signals on the adc sequences and there were no areas of hemorrhage or uh, possible classification or abnormal mineralization on the SWA sequences. Um, again, on the cerebral image, you can appreciate the volume loss in the supratentorial and infratentorial vein, also in the midbrain over there. The cervical cord, we, we didn't have any actual sequences, but um, I could not appreciate any focal lesions in the cord, possibly over here, but there is some movement of breathing artifacts uh, associated with it. So I'm not sure if this is real or spurious. Uh, hyper intensities in the cervical cord. Post contrast, um, the posterior fossa lesions demonstrate this almost fluffy cloud like uh, peripheral enhancement uh, pattern in the bilateral hemisphere, predominantly on the left side. There are also some cranial nerve involvement uh, demonstrating enhancement bilateral facial nerve. Um, you can see over here on the left side and also on the right side, thalamic lesions demonstrate punctate uh, enhancement, and there was no enhancement, meningeal enhancement in the supratentorial brain. The pituitary gland, which was also an important marker for infiltrated disorders, was normal. Uh, there was not, if not thickened. And these are zoomed in images of the cranial nerves. You can see that the trigeminal nerves also demonstrate some degree of enhancement on both sides. And the bilateral vestibular cochlea and facial nerve complexes demonstrate these enhancing patterns. Uh, there was also leptomeningeal enhancement of the cauda equina nerve roots, um, dorsal more than the ventral aspects. I don't have an axial sequence. So based on that, uh, we thought of possibilities of uh, demyelination to affect demyelination, MOG antibody related disorders. Uh, NMOSD was less likely, but since we tested together, uh, these both were the possibilities uh, suggested. Other possibilities were the lymphoid, the inflammatory processes such as related to the lymphoid process, uh, seen as granulomatosis. Uh, and uh, HLH was less likely, but anything, the enhancement pattern was not typical of HLH, they were more, more cloudy, more prominent than what we typically see in HLH. Uh, so these were the differentials that were given. And um, um, yeah, Debangna, do you have any uh, follow-ups on the labs and before we go out to the Uh Here, yeah, so we had the labs. Uh, actually, CBP, ESR, uh, CRP were all negative. So actually, mm -hmm. ferritin and uh, LDH was also done, which was negative. And there was no inf in infective and inflammatory uh, just thing. And also Morgan NMO was sent. Uh, I do not know to which lab, but it came out to be negative. So okay. and also and inflammatory pathol uh, infective has been ruled out. Serum typhus and uh, enteric had been sent, which was negative. So this is a uh, very atypical uh, it's definitely not typical for mog or acupoint for or hlh uh, did we i know you haven't seen the child but how how is the child now clinically uh they said the child is better now he's improving. better walking and talking or better uh, yeah. and, uh, cognition has improved i don't uh, uh, don't know about he's able to sit up he's able to sit up now and uh, and yeah. he's on steroids. Yeah. yeah, he's on steroids. Yeah, but only sitting up. So the child is. Yeah. 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 So it's only a very short period from the admission. So we'll have to follow up in next two weeks. Yeah, and 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 CSF was not done, or. Oh, CSF was not done. It's a very, I would be, I would struggle to label this as ADEM. Uh, I don't know, Kish, your thoughts? It's very, very unusual, the, the imaging pattern and the enhancement and, pattern. Anymore. And, and this is one month into the illness. Um, so yeah. I, uh, it's, it's a very, very unusual.
I would still go with uh, viruses uh, primarily, right, to start with. I mean, that, that whatever is in the cerebellum looks very odd. Yeah. And, and definitely, I mean, we've looked around the body. There's no other source of infections or anything else that could be. Um, so, so the child is not systemically unwell. This is all in the brain. Yeah. I mean, would, would people consider even biopsying something like that? To me, it's very odd. I mean, I would start with an LP, but, uh, but still, it's... Uh, very, very odd. And and the cranial nerve enhancement just makes you worry a bit about infiltrative process. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think Kish, we probably would have gone for a biopsy here. Something. I mean, we would have done an LP first, but if the LP wouldn't have given us a striking answer, um, it's um, very unusual. Yeah, and labeling things like Lyme. I mean, uh, Lyme is, uh, you know, the most the highest uh, false positivity in a test. So it's it's a bit hard to. Um... So does a bilateral thalamic involvement point towards more of a immune mediated process rather than infiltrative? Yeah, but I think with those things, it's not just about the location. It's also about, you know, the lesion morphology, the enhancement pattern, the, the relation between how ill the child is and how you know we've seen some cases with hlh normally be like this and then the child is totally fine like you know this is an acute presentation of something the child was well now he's not well this is uh you know a few weeks into the illness um i i, I don't think you can just look at location of the lesion uh and and based on that say what it is uh you know you can you can say that uh, you know you've seen a mog patient with thalamic lesion but if you look at the cerebellum it doesn't look like mog Sure, sure. Thanks. I think we, and, and, it, and it applies actually, maybe it's just as a learning point, even like with the new MOG diagnostic criteria, you know, if you have some features that are in keeping with some criteria, actually the fact that you have some other lesions that are not in keeping typical with the disease, a lot of the time, you know, it's an opt out versus an opt in kind of thing. So we do get a scan. Very worrying. I think this child very worrying from the MRI. So do we get a follow-up uh, now or directly go to check the status of the regions? How long was the how was long was the scan done? I mean, when was the when was this scan from? It was a month back, I guess. Yeah, I definitely get another scan with contrast. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if you want to, you know, discuss it with us, you know, before the next meeting, whether you want to, but I'm sure Kish wouldn't mind that we can look at it. But yeah, definitely get another scan. I think with those type of disorders repeating the imaging if the if if things don't make sense uh, a lot of the time help because you see where it's going uh, and an lp yeah if if uh, i think that yeah. would also be mm. okay uh, so probably you'll convey that and get the follow up scan and then have it over on the next meeting if possible uh, okay, we'll convey this. Thank you. Um, I think this is our last case, Dr. G, over to you. I think Dr. G has left us. Uh, okay, I can't see her. Prabhjot, if you're there, uh, I put on, I put up your images. Maybe we'll discuss this case uh, for the next meeting. Hi, Nihal, you want to discuss Hi. this uh, case now? Yeah, it's okay. okay. You can take a quick uh, brief frame because we discussed the same similar imaging pattern in the last meeting, and I just put up the images. Okay. So this girl was some 11 or 12 years old girl, developmentally normal, cognitively very good, had presented with two episodes of general seizures. Her EEG, I, I think, was okay, but the imaging revealed this. And uh, um, so I was considering that it is uh, ACTA uh, because the imaging was very uh, um, suggestive of ACTA too. But uh, the genetic came out to be negative. Um, 
and i got a neck vessel ultrasound also done that was also okay abdominal mm-hmm. ultrasound was also okay and she did not have any other systemic uh, features of any smooth muscle involvement so i think i had sent this scan to you because last meet we discussed this yeah, scan yeah yeah I think it was from Dr. Juhi and Utkarsh, and we are thinking of actor mimics as Dr. Mankar had, had discussed with the MY H uh, one one having similar imaging pattern. Yes. So uh, I had thought I'll send it to the next meet. I had got a genetic okay. stand, but it w- did not show one of those mutations that we had discussed last okay. time. I think okay. somebody just pointed out MYH. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was not there. It was some channelopathy mutation had come out to be positive, which was not con- clinically consistent. And okay. it was variant okay. of unknown significance. But the imaging is uh, very identical to Utkarsh's uh, case. Probably you have two similar cases, two actor two mimics over there. Yeah. So any inputs like what else should we do? The genetics are negative. The parents are not very mm-hmm. keen on any further testing because the child is okay. Uh, so yeah, I don't know what it is. Prabhjot, if you are very, very sure about this diagnosis only, you can ask the lab to have a relook and I also ask them to look for any deletion duplications rather than just point mutations. Uh, I, I asked that them will require a different uh, methodology. So my med genome these days, you know, small deletion duplications they are picking up and giving. But I asked them to reanalyze for the specific mutations and they gave back the report saying that it is negative. Okay. And the other odd thing is for actor, ma'am, she does not have any uh, stroke-like presentation like we usually associate with actor. Uh, and scholastically also, she is uh, very good. Okay, okay. thanks. No, the, in the whole exome, no, they pick up uh, 70% of the copy number variance, which is the deletion duplication. 30% they cannot pick up on the whole exome. You'll have to go for microarray or uh, something like that. Copy number variance, only 70% of the deletion duplications they can pick up. Yeah. So I think CMA is probably the next thing to do. Yeah, chromosomal microarray, if everything is coming negative. Okay. Big deletions and duplications. Okay. So I think I'll uh, have a word with Juhi yeah. also and uh, see what they're up to and then probably get back uh, with this patient. No, I don't think it's from, from Juhi. It was from the one of the radiologists, so the Utkarsh. Dr. Utkarsh. Uh, yeah. So an adult, uh, neuro, adult neurologist had uh, sent them. I think it's going to anyway go to one of the pediatric neurologists. So oh. yeah, you can probably discuss with him. I guess. I'll, I'll discuss with Dr. Utkarsh. Yeah. He's on the chat, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Nihal. Yeah, no problem. All right. Thanks. That's our last case. Um, Utkarsh, do you want to discuss the uh, previous one? Uh, Dr. Joey isn't there, I think. Or we'll probably wait for... We'll do it when she's there. That's okay. So that's our last case. And um, thanks once again for the active involvement and uh, suggestions. We'll meet again on the 26th of May. And I kindly request you to send all your cases 